started. So we do early. Yeah. Yeah, talk to me. Okay, one announcement, and that is that uh, well, we have, we have uh, one talk coming up uh, next week in seminar, and then two weeks from now we have a visitor, Christy Bly, will be joining us from World Wildlife Fund. She is the uh, third graduate student selection, selected seminar speaker for the year. So there will be activities announced shortly um, uh, uh, regarding Christie's visit. Um, Emily Mitchell is handling her visit, so please get in touch with her once you see uh, some of the information starting to come out about scheduling times for meetings and, and things like that, okay? All right, so um, today I'd like to introduce Adam Kauth. Um, he is from Wayne State uh, College. Or you College. 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 Wayne State College in Nebraska, where he did his undergraduate. Currently um, doing his master's with um, John Jenks, and he's going to talk to us about uh, reassessing survival, movement, habitat selection, and sightability of pronghorn in South Dakota. Right. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, like like I already mentioned, uh, our project is reassessing the survival, movement, habitat selection, and sightability of Walmart and South Dakota. So, to give you a little background information, uh, prior to 1800, there was an estimated population of about 700,000 pronghorn uh, found throughout the state of South Dakota. However, with the advent of people moving into the into the West during the 1800s, those populations dramatically declined. And by 1909, pronghorn were actually considered extinct east of the Missouri River in the state. And by 1924, uh, there was only an estimated 680 remaining in western South Dakota. However, through management and restoration efforts that included uh, relocating pronghorn from areas such as Butte County uh, to other regions in western South Dakota, the population increased and by the end of the century, it was estimated at about 33,000. Uh, because pronghorn have uh, a public interest to both uh, sportsmen and non-sportsmen, uh, knowledge of pronghorn ecology is essential in order to effectively manage those populations. And previous research has been conducted on pronghorn in the past in South Dakota. Uh, that includes research in Harding County in the Northwest, Fall River County in the Southwest, and in the Black Hills, Wind Cave National Park. Uh, however, information remains somewhat limited in other regions and counties of South Dakota. And from literature, uh, cow predation is considered a significant mortality factor uh, when it comes to pronghorn survival, particularly with neonates. And research from 2002 to 2005 conducted in South Dakota uh, was during a period when Kyle populations and densities were thought to be lower uh, due to sarcoptic mage and uh, predator control during that time. Uh, however, anecdotal evidence uh, suggests that those Kyle populations have since then increased and that current survival rates for pronghorn uh, may be lower. Uh, this would inhibit uh, South Dakota Game and Fish and Parks ability to accurately uh, model those populations and model those populations. Um, uh, additionally, South Dakota Game, Fish, and Parks is interested in reassessing uh, spring aerial surveys uh, for estimating population size. So, our objectives to our research were to, are to, uh, one, determine survival and cause-specific mortality uh, for adult and fawn pronghorn, as well as yearlings. Uh, we want to look at this from all different age demographics within the population. Uh, two, we want to determine seasonal movements and calculate home range sizes. Uh, we want to be able to compare differences in uh, seasonal home ranges and see what pronghorn are using at certain times of the year. And that ties us into our third objective, uh, which is to document seasonal habitat selection. Uh, we want to know what type of resources are, uh, pronghorn are using uh, and at what specific times of the year. And then four, uh, we want to revise viability coefficients for estimating population size from aerial flights. Uh, so we chose Butte County as our study area. Uh, Butte County is in western South Dakota. It's about 5,800 square kilometers in size. And as illustrated by the map, 
Uh, it represents a, a region in the eastern extension of sagebrush steppe communities that we find uh, throughout the western United States. Uh, sagebrush communities that are uh, vital to some pronghorn populations in those regions. And those uh, sagebrush communities in South and in Butte County uh, represent uh, less than 25% of the habitat found in the region. The data from the USDA indicates that grass, uh, pasture land, uh, makes up about 80% of the habitat vegetation type that we find in Butte County. And we usually identify uh, grass and pasture land as makes a short grass prairie uh, in uh, western South Dakota. Shrubland, which includes our sagebrush communities uh, and cropland such as winter weeds and alfalfa fields, uh, each make up about 10% of that remaining uh, habitat type. So we need to put radio collars on pronghorn and our animal handling protocol is approved by the Institutional Care and Use Committee here at South Dakota State University. Our, our, our goal is to capture 50 adult and yearling female pronghorn uh, using a helicopter capture company uh, by net gunning techniques. And we will capture these individuals during the winter months of our study uh, and only capture when conditions are favorable temperature wise uh, in order to minimize stress on those animals. So each individual will be fitted with a VHF radio collar uh, equipped with a mortality sensor that's designed to activate uh, when the collar is no longer moving after eight hours. We'll also uh, age each individual according to a yearling or adult uh, based on teeth wear uh, and collect a blood sample to test for blood titers for diseases known to infect pronghorn populations such as EHD. And that will be analyzed at the Animal Health Diagnostic Center at Cornell University. And as a side note, we want to handle and, and, and release all these animals uh, at the location that we capture them. Additionally, we want to capture at least 40 fawns uh, for each year of our study uh, using hand capturing methodology provided by buyers. Each fawn will be fitted with a VHF breakaway uh, uh, radio collar. Uh, that's equipped that's equipped with a mortality sensor that's designed to activate after four hours when the collar is no longer moving. Each fawn will be uh, determined as a male or female, a uh, wave, and then aged uh, based on physiological characteristics such as umbilical condition, uh, but also from uh, pre-capture observations. Uh, we're considering adults a year and a half or older in age and, and yearlings to be a half a year to a year and a half. Um, those individuals will be the premise for our uh, home range uh, uh, movement and resource selection analysis. Uh, so we want to monitor those individuals one to three times per week uh, and uh, collect by visual and aerial observations. Uh, aerial observations will be uh, collected using a Cessna 172 uh, fixed wing aircraft uh, with uh, telemetry equipment. Uh, for our fawns, we're going to monitor them daily for nine weeks post-capture uh, and then two to three times per week thereafter uh, up to six months of age. At six months of age, they'll then be classified as yearlings uh, and then we'll start collecting locational data on them as well uh, for our analyses on uh, home ranges and habitat selection. Uh, for any individuals where we can't determine uh, cost-specific mortality in the field, uh, those specimens will be collected uh, to either be analyzed here in ecropsy here at South Dakota State University or at Cornell. So we're going to use a Kaplan-Meier procedure with known fate and modified for staggered entry uh, in order to determine seasonal and annual survival rates for adults, yearlings, and fawns. And we will break uh, our seasonal survival into three time categories, uh, a pre-hunt, a hunt, and a post-hunt time interval. For our home range analysis, uh, we're going to calculate kernel density estimates, or KDEs, uh, with uh, a smoothing parameter in statistical package R in order to calculate 50% and 95% home range sizes. Uh, those home range sizes and polygons will be uh, viewed in ArcGIS ArcMap in order to differentiate between uh, potential seasonal home ranges. And the way we do that uh, is, is if those locations for that time during uh, 
for winter and summer, if they don't overlap, they're considered uh, two distinct home ranges. Uh, if those points all overlap and it, it creates one polygon, it's just create, uh, considered an annual uh, home range. Uh, additionally, it will then uh, determine uh, distance traveled for those individuals that are considered uh, dispersers or migrators. Uh, additionally, we're going to create maps using national land cover data uh, in ArcGIS in order to ground verify the habitats within and surrounding pronghorn locations and home ranges in our study area. Uh, that information will be used to uh, calculate chi-square and selection ratios, uh, where selection ratios will be used to determine if selection is positive, negative, or neutral for those specified habitats. And we want to look at this as a design two and design three analysis. Uh, design two, which is at the individual level, or at the population level, and design three, which is at the individual level. Uh, we're also going to use our radio collar pronghorn uh, to, to, to detect for visibility biases associated with spring aerial surveys. Uh, and we're going to use an aerial strip and line transect survey technique uh, provided by Gunzel and Jakes. And in order to minimize potential bias, we're going to use multiple observers and our surveys will be flown at least two days apart. Uh, our goal is to collect at least 200 distinct <coughs> observations uh, based on radio collared pronghorn. In order to match uh, South Dakota Game Fish and Parks spring aerial surveys, uh, we're gonna fly our uh, surveys during the spring from mid-April to late May uh, using a Cessna 172 fixed wing aircraft uh, flown at 125 to 145 kilometers per hour and 45 to 60 meters above the, uh, above the ground. Uh, there will be two trained observers in the front seat of the plane that will be surveying for pronghorn. Uh, one observer will be the pilot, and the other observer will be a South Dakota Game Fish and Parks uh, employee. There will also be a non-observer uh, in the back seat of the plane that will be scanning for radio collar pronghorn uh, during these surveys. Uh, we're gonna create predetermined transects and survey blocks uh, based on uh, known locations prior, before and prior to each survey. Uh, uh, those transects will be created using uh, Garmin Basecamp software uh, where the transects will be 800 meters apart and running in a north and south fashion. And as kind of shown by the picture, uh, the plane will fly directly over the transect at the prescribed height and speed and the two observers will count all pronghorn groups that are within 400 meters of that transect and notify the uh, non-observer when doing so. Uh, regardless if a group of pronghorn with a radio card individual is observed or not, uh, we're going to measure the sightability coefficients for that group at that time. And the, the variables that we're looking at are include group size, uh, which is any number of pronghorn greater than or equal to one individual in that group. Uh, in situations where there may be two uh, collar, group, uh, collar pronghorn within that group, uh, that'll still be considered as just one observation. Other variables include activity, uh, the behavior of the animal, whether it's bedded, standing, or running, uh, habitat, grassland, sagebrush, uh, cropland, uh, any habitat that we expect to find within the study area, uh, landscape background, which coincides with uh, the spring green up in different <laughs> soil types, that may inhibit the observer from observing those pronghorn from the plane because those pronghorn are blending into the environment's background. Uh, and then topography, uh, non-rugged, semi-rugged, and rugged. Uh, after we collect the information, we will then resume, uh, on our, the, resume our surveys on the transect that we left off. Uh, that information will be used to uh, uh, for our side of bill analysis and where we will create a logistic regression in program R and our response variable will be uh, groups detected or groups not detected. And we'll compare that uh, and set up our models based on previous research that Christopher Jakes did in the, in the uh, uh, did with pronghorn 10, 15 years ago in South Dakota as well. Uh, this information allows South Dakota Game Fish and Parks to uh, more accurately model uh, and manage pronghorn populations in the state, uh, as well as understand population trends and set a basis for uh, harvest quotas during the hunting season. Also understand factors that are potentially influencing pronghorn currently uh, and, and potentially in the future, 
Uh, that involves environmentally in terms of predator-prey dynamics, uh, the impact there, or the role that coyotes have on pronghorn survival, uh, anthropogenically how pronghorn are moving across the landscape in relation to uh, roads and fence lines or how they're using certain resources such as cropland uh, and then energy development and how that may affect uh, potentially affect pronghorn behavior down the road. Um, special thanks to uh, Dr. Jenks, South Dakota Game Fish and Park staff, Kevin Roebling, Eddie Lindum, Jan, and John Kanta, uh, and Feral Agency Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Restoration. Uh, Lynn Sided. Any questions? Sightability models have a long history, and there's a long history with different species. Um, have you guys considered looking at some of the spatially stratified um, techniques like those that Jay Burke published for moose? Uh, well, the big reason we, we the protocol of our hands when we do it is uh, and since Christopher Jason did. Dakota State, our game fish park really can't use that model is because of the way he uh, outlined it in the protocol. He actually had four observers in the plane uh, when South Dakota Game Fish and Parks only has three uh, where they use the uh, pilot as, as an observer. Uh, so we have to be very careful in terms of setting it up in a way that is beneficial to South Dakota Game Fish and Parks uh, since this is the information that they're going to use. Um, so I'm not really familiar with uh, yeah, check out for hoop stuff because they, they, they made even a little app that um, the state guys can go in and put their numbers in and it kicks them out a, oh. a population estimate right away. And the only thing they do is it's, it's kind of a pre-density um, estimate that use um, habitat be kind of stratified based on whether or not you get the habitat seems good and how many you expect to see. And then it's a spatial freezing and all the different kinds of things. really flying a plane at 60 meters above the ground yeah yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> are you gonna be in it yep <laughs> yes yeah. how long do you think it'd be before game fish and parks is because it's usually a drone rather than a plane <laughs> <laughs> at 60 meters i hope so <laughs> I, I have no idea i know that with those drones and everything it's a whole different set of technology coming in i don't know how they're going to apply that with um, wildlife management nowadays, but it'll be interesting. It's, it's, it's the new emerging technology. Yeah, for sure. sure. They need a bigger one, though, so you probably still need to get the military involved. <laughs> <laughs> Is it common for pilots to be observers in a lot of these detection studies? Uh, yes and no, I guess. I mean, I know that South Dakota Game Fish and Park says it. I think the reason a lot of agencies might do it is just because of time and money restraints um, you know, I, I kind of prefer my pilot to be paying attention to the one thing but I don't know <laughs> I, I mean I haven't done this it's super common yeah because uh, okay. a lot of times they, they do them in tandem aircraft if you want to observers the pilots do the other one so just, especially if you're only 60 meters <laughs> I'm just thinking that is, that is one thing we, we measure too uh, observing for pronghorn groups, we, we recorded who was observed in which groups. Um, so if we did miss a group and it did happen to be on the pilot side, uh, we can count that as a, as a variable in, in, in pronghorn detection outside of the label. Yep. The person scanning with the related for the group, will they be scanning before the group is spotted or after? Uh, well, how it works is, uh, they're scanning at, this, at the time uh, of that survey. So, uh, wait, wait, did you pick up one before the observers? Do you think it'll bias their attention toward them? Well, that's that's the hope that when the, the non-observers sit in the back, uh, and I, we, we've already kind of done this, and so when I was in the back, I had to make sure that when I was paying attention to where these pronghorn were in relation to the transect, that I wasn't giving cues you know, to the two in front in case we're looking back and saying, okay, which way is he looking? So I had to kind of, you know, 
mess with them a little bit in terms of like, okay, there's nothing here, but there really was. Um, and there was a lot of going back and forth where, uh, you know, if there was a group and I wasn't sure if that was it, we would just go back and look at it and make sure. Uh, and then we'd still record all those variables with it. Uh, so there's a little bit of trial and error with it, but we got, we got it kind of figured out uh, as we went with it. Yeah, what do pronghorn eat? Well, uh, a sagebrush is a big uh, a part of their diet, particularly at certain times of the year, uh, since pronghorn are considered a browse species. Um, during the winter, they, they tend to select more for uh, sagebrush, uh, and we've seen that they do select somewhat for uh, uh, certain types of agricultural land, like alfalfa fields. Um, but during the spring, when they have that, uh, that forb quality come up, they have a, a, a different uh, uh, diet as well. So uh, there's been some research with Christopher Jakes and what their diet compositions are, but sagebrush make up a big part of it. How confident are you in the national data? National land cover data. Land cover data determining that it's sagebrush or grass. Well, that's what I meant by ground verifying. So when we printed off these maps in the study area, we have to go back and based off of pronghorn locations and health ranges, and we have to ground verify and say, okay, that is sagebrush, and then just kind of make marks on a map. So are you going to go physically on the ground, or are you just... Yeah, physically on the ground to actually make sure that that habitat matches up with uh, what it's supposed to be. So like, what kind of vegetation data would you collect and the methods would you use? Well, also, there is going to be some... Uh, I, don't, I hope it comes out with the National Land Cover where they're actually creating a sagebrush uh, habitat community uh, in the west, like the northern Great Plains where are the northern and the Rocky Mountains that you would expect sagebrush. Uh, it's supposed to be at a quality of like 30 meters or whatever, but um, essentially it, it's a little bit of trial and error uh, between like determining what's sagebrush and what's what you would consider uh, grassland, there's a little subjectivity. Um, but you're not going to run a transect on the ground? No. And right. then do line intercept or things like that? No, we're not. We're, we're strictly going to look at the, the macro level and not the micro level. Uh, let, 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 let's give West River a chance to uh, <laughs> answer, ask any questions. <laughs> Um, does anyone uh, remotely have any questions at this point? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right, Dom. Um, so false alarm. Sorry, folks. Okay. Let's thank Adam once more. Next week and then two weeks from today, um, Christy Bly. Thanks, everyone.